we thank the Marcus family for their uh, contribution, their donation of this of the year's class in honor and in memory of Irma Haas and Hilda Meyer, two, uh, two aunts of theirs whom I knew personally during my years in Englewood, so it's very meaningful for me. All right. We're going to take a look at the, the onset of the journey of Avraham and Sarah. And we're going to look at three events that are in Parshish Lech Lecha and try to understand them and try to learn the lessons that might emerge from them. The first, I will tell you, I was very, very tempted to skip because it is one of the most difficult texts to understand. And Avram's actions are, 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 it would seem, very questionable. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to take a look, but I realize that it's a pattern that repeats itself intergenerationally. It not only repeats itself with Avram, but it repeats with Yitzchak as well. So to be fair, if we're really going to learn Chumash B'Yun, we've got to tackle the difficult questions as well as the easier questions. So let's take a look at this first event. And let's try to understand how we might be able to, uh, to comprehend it. The Torah says, of <laughs> Now, let's understand when this famine occurs. Let's set the stage. Kodesh Baruch Hu has commanded Avraham Lech Lecha. <coughs> Avraham understands that this is supposed to be to the land of Canaan. And sure enough, when he reaches the land of Canaan, Kodesh Baruch Hu says, this is, this is your land. But no sooner does he reach Eretz Canaan than what happens? There's a famine. Right away. Immediately. Vayira baretz vayered Avram Mitzrayim alav v'orsham v'yikaved harav baretz. And Moshe and Avram goes down to live in the land of Egypt, lagur sham. And we're going to take a look, we'll look at the word lagur in a little while. Because the, the famine is heavy in the land. He gets Sora close to, to Egypt. He says to Sarai, his wife, I know now or I see that you are a beautiful woman. This is going to be dangerous for us. Look at the underlying line. Imri no achosi at. I want you to tell anyone who asks that you are my sister, do not let them know that you are my what? My wife, right? Because otherwise they might kill me and do this so that instead they will treat me well and I will live because of you. Sure enough, they go down to Mitzrayim. The Egyptians see Sarai. These Sarai Paro, the um, officers of the king, see Sarai. And sure enough, this beautiful lady is brought to the palace of Paro. HaKadosh Baruch Hu punishes Paro for, for taking Sarai. And he, he understands what's going on. He calls Avram and he says, why did you lie to me? Look at what you've done to me and to my household. And he chases Avram out of the country. <coughs> All right, so that if there are two potential errors, <laughs> sins, that Avram makes in this paragraph. The first is a little difficult to see. The second one is obvious. What's the first potential sin? Mm -hmm. That what? Deception. He left Canaan. He left Canaan. Perhaps HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants him to stay. Mm -hmm. And to what? To trust in God. God told him to come here after all. Perhaps his, his test at this point is to stay in the land, to endure the famine, and have belief that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to what? Take care. It's going to take care of him. That's numero uno. Yeah. But there's famine. Like, yeah. So maybe, so so maybe, maybe he's supposed to stay and believe that a Kurdish Baruch will provide food for him and his family. 
That's like the rule of fundraising that God will provide. Which okay. <laughs> which doesn't always work. Yes. Yeah. 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 Correct. So, right. you know, Elimelech leaves the land is castigated for doing so. All right. So we'll. So yeah. we're going to explore this. I'm not. I'm not giving up on your observation. All right. Your observation that there's famine and the well, I shouldn't he leave the land is an observation. We'll come back to it. Yaakov's sons also because of the famine. Yaakov's sons also leave the land because of famine, right? But that after waiting a while, after waiting until it gets. Avram seems to leave right away. It's, it doesn't, the answer is that you are correct. It could be that there was a period of time that he waited. We don't know. All right, and what's the second sin, potentially? Lying concerning Sarai's identity and endangering Sarai, right? Putting her in a position where... where <coughs> They won't take her if, his, if, if it's his sister, if it's his wife. But if it's his sister, then perhaps they'll take her and do well for him. And what, what am I doing? I'm sacrificing Sorai for my benefit? Under the bus. Very difficult. Very, very difficult. Rabbi, yes. I don't think it's necessary to Abraham to sin. In ancient time, you talk about the, the regime of the Egyptians or any other if the man and wife, the wife is beautiful, the other party usually, if they knew this is cultural, they kill the husband and take right. the wife. Okay, that's what he's saying. He's saying, you're, you're correct, that he's saying, say you're my sister because if you say you're my wife, they'll kill me and um, Thank you. I want to protect myself. But I, my question is, obviously, I'm protecting myself at whose cost? At her, At her cost, ah. right? In other words, they're going to take her. Yes. I think there's one of the commentators talks about the fact that it was typical for the for brother to control the the sister, and then if someone wanted to marry the sister, they had to go to the brother, so that he could, Abraham could drive a hard bargain and okay. to try and protect Sarah. Right. Okay. I want everybody to hear that because we're going to come back to that. That per perhaps. It was the custom that if I came with my sister, the brother is going to be dealt with in terms of purchasing the sister on some level. Well, now the right? king has to ask them okay, but the king doesn't have to. You're, you guys are actually, you know, what happens is you, you cut my shear short because <laughs> you're coming up with, with, with a whole range of things here that we're going to take a look at. Yes? If, if the question of endangering Sarah's life is one thing, but he was basically giving her over to another man to do with whatever he wants right. to do with it because it's a sister, not a wife. So it's, in a sense, it's even worse. It's not even endangering. What you're saying is it's not endangering Sarai's life, but endangering Sarai's virtue. Yeah. In other words, he's putting her in a position where if the king or anyone thinks it's his sister, they're not going to think that they're, they're having relations with someone's wife, and therefore they'll be in a position of, 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 of difficulty. All right. Yes. I'm trying a little bit to figure out the timing of how long she was there. Right. And it says it went well with him and he acquired sheep, oxen, etc. That sounds like a long time. Sounds like she was there for a while. All right. Well, we're not clear. It's not clear. Well, they could have immediately given him all these gifts. So it could have so been So the quickly. acquiring was all because of her. That's correct. Right. The acquiring is because of her. All right. So let's take a look first at the Ramban. The Ramban, it's very interesting. The Ramban says the following. Let's look at the Hebrew. Yodea ki Avraham avinu chatam chet gadol bishkaga. Says the Ramban, I want you to know, and you should know, that Avraham avinu sinned a great sin unintentionally. Right? Why? He should he he sinned unintentionally, in other words, he felt he had no choice, and therefore this is a sin that 
he's, he feels compelled to, to make. But not in that, not, not, nonetheless, it's a sin because he puts his wife into a position where, where she will be uh, abused, as it were, by, by, the, by, the, by those around. And keep going. Vegam, I'm look, moving to the last two words on the second line. Gam yitzia som in ha'oret shenitztavo alel bitchilo v'etnei ha'ro'ov. Avon Asher Choto, Kirokim Barav Yiftedu. And the fact that he left Canaan in the face of the famine, guess what? That was a sin too. And he should have stayed, and he should have had faith if this is where God wanted him to go. He should have had faith that Hashem would be Podehim, would, would save him from the rob. Okay, stay with me, yes. Seems to sound like human beings don't have any chirach of shit. And what you're suggesting is human oh, beings don't don't, you're, don't have the chirach of shit because Hashem. Hashem just sit and trust in Hashem. And we don't believe it. Okay, so if you'll skip for a moment to down the page to eternal issues, I said that one of the things we're going to struggle here with is the balance between Hishtavut and Emuna. And the fact that the Ramban <coughs> is taking this position doesn't mean that everyone agrees. It's very possible that we might feel that, that Avram does the right thing in the face of famine. Right? And that in the face of famine, he's not supposed to just sit and say, Hashem is going to take care of me. But he is told, he, he is forced to do his hishtadlus to save his family, himself and his family. And this is an eternal issue because one has to, one has to try to decide in, in the face of every, every event that we have, where does my hishtadlus end and my emuna begin? At what point do I, do I end my what my... And vice versa. When does my amuna end and my hishtadlus begin? Either way. But the fact is this balance is, is a balance that we struggle. It's amazing. It's amazing how the issues in the Torah are as relevant to us in our lives as the, the, the pages of the, of the newspaper. Where does our hishtadlus begin and end? I mean, I think I told you about that, the story of a doctor I knew who, who basically... One of his patients came in and, and during the during the COVID crisis and wasn't wearing a mask, and he turned to him and said, "Put on a mask." And the patient said, "Too much, too much hishtadlus." No, what does that mean? It means I, 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 God's going to take care of me. I'm, I don't have to do hishtadlus. Now, there, if you take. What? What happened to that guy? Did he I COVID? kicked him out of his office. No, did he get COVID? I don't know if he got COVID. I don't know if he got COVID, but he kicked him out of his office. All right? He got hit by a truck. I got hit by a truck. Yes. Hashem allows Abraham to go to But in contrast to the son very good, very good point. In the case of Avram leaving the land, Hashem doesn't stop it. In the next generation, in the face of famine, Yitzchak tries to leave the land, and Hashem stops him and says, stay where you are. So that might be a hint that in this case, this wasn't a sin. And perhaps in this case, Hakadosh Baruch Hu understands that Moshe is doing that. Avram is doing his shabbos. Yes. In the case of Yaakov, Hashem told him to go. Yes, but Yitzchak cannot leave Eretz Yisrael. Yeah, Yitzchak, well, Yitzchak, Yitzchak can't leave Eretz Yisrael for other reasons. So we'll get to that when we talk about Yitzchak. Okay. All right. One more comment, and then I got to move on. Would you say that that? Um, we have to learn from that, that we, that we can do because Abraham is Abraham. Okay, so the answer seems to be that the point that's being made is if we assume that Abraham is right in leaving the land, then the lesson we learn is that we must do our hishabus, that we can simply rely on God's 
benevolence to save us, which is, which is the point you raise. Now, none of this explains the second, not, the second sin, right? In other words, none of this explains how Avram could possibly have maneuvered things to put Sarah into, into danger. And the Ramban says that there were two sins, right? The first one, we can, we can argue, was it a sin, was it a sin? In terms of endangering Sarai, it would seem that we're stuck. It would seem that we're in a position where we... There, uh, so you're suggesting that there he had emunah that Hashem would help him, but, he, but you... But do you put, do you deliberately put your wife in danger and say, okay, God's going to help me, right? Maybe Avram, maybe Avram should have had belief that Hashem would protect him if he, if he said she was his wife, right? So maybe I should, right, where does, and why does Avram go, he's going to the one place where this is going to happen. Aren't there other places where Avram could go where, where, where it would not be this way? Apparently not, because we'll see that in the case of Avimelech, the same thing occurs. All right. Uh, two comments. I have a question, just a All technical. Right. Yeah. Women did not cover their faces in those those times. Uh, women did not cover their faces in those Imagine times. If women good question. Covered, I have some idea that women. Apparently, apparently they were able to see her beauty. So it would seem eyes, that her eyes, face, eyes, or her eyes, eyes may have been beautiful, or or yeah. whatever. Okay. It seems to be a pattern with Yako that he runs away from confrontation. When it comes to this, he runs. He, he Yaakov says, or Avram. Avram runs away from confrontation. He tells uh, uh, Sarah, "Tell say you're my sister." And he tells uh, when Sarah wants Yitzchak to leave, uh, Ishmael to, to leave. leave. Ishmael to leave. He says no, and now so he's putting Yitzchak at risk, and he's putting uh, from Ishmael, and he's putting Sarah at risk. Because he seems to run from confrontation. Okay, we'll see. That's he seems just, to run uh, from confrontation. A, a pattern I Interesting, noticed. interesting. But again, but again, this is confrontation that he is he, he is allowing to 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 occur. Now we're going to take a look at the Svarno. Ramon Svarno has is, is fascinating in terms of his approach to both of these events. Now, before we go any further. The fact that the Ramban admits that Avram sinned is a big deal, isn't it? All right. In other words, before we go to the Svarno, let's understand that the, that that means that this great commentary was regular was was uh, was comfortable admitting that Avram made mistakes. Now, this is an important point for us to stop at before we go to the Svarno, and that is when it comes to the heroes of the Torah. There really is a spectrum of opinion. There are those who will say they err and they make mistakes. And there are those who will even twist and turn to say, no, no, we cannot, we have no right to say that Avram made mistakes. Or, and, and perhaps the most obvious case of this twisting and turning is when Yaakov lies to his father, right? And you find that Rashi will say, what does Yaakov say? Anochi Esav b'chorecha, right? He outright says, I'm Esav, at his, at his mother's behest, right, at request. And yet, at the same time, Rashi will come along and say, no, you're not punctuating it right. Anochi, period. I am who I am. Esav is b'chorecha. And, you, and Esau is your firstborn. And what you find is this tension between those who are saying, you know what, Yaakov did what he did. And in, in a sense, there are those who will argue that he gets paid back in his lifetime. How many times does Yaakov get deceived by others? So although maybe he had a right to do it, we're going to get to that. And although he may have had every reason, every, every reason to do it, because his mother's basically pushing him to do it, nonetheless, nonetheless, maybe he is paid back. So let's understand that when it comes, what I, what I often say is, the pagans treated their heroes as gods. The Israel Jews come along and we treat our heroes as people. The Christians come along and they treat their, people, their heroes once again as what? Gods. When you have heroes who are gods, you can worship them, but you can't emulate them. 
when you have heroes who are people, then you can look at them and say, there are aspects of them that I wish to emulate. And that's, that's the way we look at our heroes. Now, the star now is, yes, last, last, last point. Sorry, does the Rabban generally believe that first? That, that, um, does the Rabban generally believe like this? It, the answer to that is, I don't know whether he generally believes like that. But it would seem that from the, his comments here, that yes, that, that, you should, that you should have. Now let's understand, there are cases in the Torah where Hishtadlus is very real. Yaakov Avinu is about to meet Esau. He prepares in three ways, right? He doesn't just pray and say, Akkadosh Baruch Hu is going to take care of me. What does he do? He sends gifts, he prepares, with the, he prepares his army. So it's, so it's very clear that Hishtadlus emerges from the text itself at times. No, no, no. What I'm asking is this, is this the Rambrand's philosophy of everything? Okay, and my answer is I don't know the answer to that as to whether this is his philosophy on everything. I think he takes it on a case-by-case -case basis and, and says the fact that you just arrived in, in Eretz Canaan, where God told you to go, and the minute it gets hard, you turn around and you leave, that's no Hishtadus. Okay. Last another, comment. There might be another issue with Ramban is very into Eretz Yisrael. That is correct. That's a good, very good point. Very good point. The Ramban is very, very much a supporter of the importance of the land of Israel to the point that he says that every mitzvah you perform, even if it's not tied to the land, every mitzvah you perform, says the Ramban, is incomplete outside the land of Israel. If a man puts on tefillin in Englewood, New Jersey, it's not a complete mitzvah. It's only a complete mitzvah according to the Ramban, and he proves it from text, but we're going to, we'll get to that. We get to that when we get to that. Also, also makes it one of his life's missions yeah. to get one of the mitzvot, in, the mitzvot one, right, in his list of mitzvot, and he makes it his life mission to come here. All right, let's go on. You know, I, I'd like to stay where we are because we haven't tackled the difficult question, right? Now, let's take a look at the Sfarno. The Sfarno comments, first of all, when concerning Moshe, concerning Avram, I gave another class on Moshe earlier, concerning Avraham's descent into Egypt, he says, take a look at the words carefully. Lagur Shem. Now, there are two ways that the Torah will normally talk about someone living in the land. One is Lagur, and the other one is Lashem. What does Lagur mean? Sojourn. Temporarily. Sojourn. Sojourn, right? So says the Sparno, and this is in Avram's defense. He doesn't rise up and say Avram did the right thing. But from the fact that he's saying Lagur, it, 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 or focusing on Lagur, it seems to be a defense of Avram's actions. That he's not going down to stay there, he's only going down to remain there temporarily. <coughs> but then he does something fascinating with the most difficult of the questions. And someone raised this as a possibility, uh, and that is the following. Take a look at the Hebrew section dealing with Sarai's abduction. If you take a look at the underlined section on page two, Svarno, second paragraph. Where and so says the Sarno, what does Avram have in mind? Avram has in mind a delaying tactic. He wants to delay the danger. And what he says is, if you say you're my sister, then they're going to start to haggle over you. Come to me and say, I'll give you this for her, I'll give you this for her. And that's going to take time. And during that time, you know what we're going to do? We'll get what we need and we'll leave. <coughs> but Avram's <coughs> plan goes awry. 
Avram's plan doesn't work. Take a look at the Hebrew, you tell me why. What happens that messes up Avram's plans? They took her. Who took her? Uh, Pharaoh's, uh, ah, what happened was, yes, it would have worked. Except what he, he didn't predict what would happen. And what exactly did happen? The, the, the population began to haggle, and along comes, sorry, Pharaoh, mm -hmm. and they say, we don't have to haggle. We're just taking her. And we're taking her to the king. And that's quite enough, and you don't mean we're not going to... So in other words, there are two psukim there. The, by, in the middle, Vayiru'a Mitzrim, and then Vayiru'a So Sore Paro. And the Sorno says those are two different <coughs> steps in the unfolding story. Mm -hmm. And it is the second of those steps that Avraham could not foresee, and therefore his plan was not to endanger Sora. His plan was a, a reasonable plan, let them haggle, let them talk, let them, da, 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 and we'll take what we need and we'll go out. So here you see Svarno defending what almost seems to be <coughs> indefensible action on the part of Avram. And that is one approach to this story that moves in the direction again of, of the patriarchs did not make mistakes. And Avraham really had a good plan here. It just got messed up. Where does this Forno take this uh, theory from? That from, the, whatever, from the text itself. The, that Avram thought that it would be haggling and there would give him Because he, where does he take the theory that he thought there would be haggling? I suppose he takes it from the fact that, it, that there are two, two sentences there. That Mitzray, the Mitzrim saw him, saw her, and then Hasare Paro saw her. And those two steps represent two different steps in the unfolding. Is it, a big it, it, is it a big stretch? It's the answer to that is depends how you look at it. And it some people will look at this and say that this is a stretch. Others will look at it and say it's a reasonable defense of Avram's actions, and that the text seems to reflect the the possibility that if the Sare Paro had not seen her that there would have been this give and take, and Avram would have been able to save his family and, and leave. So you take it where you want. Look where we got, what we have. We have the Ramban on the one hand saying it was wrong, and we don't shy away from saying it's wrong. And we have the Svarna who says we're going to find a way to find out merit in Avram's actions so that we don't have to say it's wrong. So the eternal issues that emerge from this, I told you. The balance between Emuna and Hishtakut, right? where does one <laughs> begin and the other end? And that is an ongoing struggle throughout Jewish history. The, the concept of risk taking, when are you forced to take risks and what risks are, are reasonable to take? And the last thing is the Ramban says something that I did not tell you yet. If you look at the last thing the Ramban says, which is at the top of page two, the underline section, says the Ramban, you know why we end up in Egypt? Because of Avram's mistakes. Now, that's a tough one, right? Because what do we believe about collective punishment? Do we believe in original sin? No. no, we believe that each person is responsible for their own actions. And yet, while we believe in that every individual is responsible for their actions, and we don't believe in original sin, and we don't believe generally that I'm going to be punished for, for Avram's mistakes, we do believe in what I would call intergenerational reverberation. What is intergenerational reverberation? What happens earlier has an effect upon my life. And, and if Adam and Chava would have never eaten from the tree, would our lives be different? So we're not guilty of what they did, but what they did continues to affect our lives over time. So we don't believe we're guilty for what others do. 
but we do believe that what others do can have an effect upon our lives. And perhaps in some way that that's what the Ramban is saying, that somehow this caused that kind of reverberation. It's difficult to see the connection between our going to Mitzrayim and what he does here, but nonetheless, maybe. All right, I'll take two comments and then we'll move on. The Ramban is basically specifying that it's Egypt, but the original, the original promise that uh, Hashem made to Avram in Ben Absarim was that you're going to go down to a land that's not yours. Okay. He doesn't specify this right. So what Ramban may be saying is because of this incident, uh, it's got to be That Mitzrayim. had to be Mitzrayim. Okay, mm -hmm. watch. Just a good, very interesting suggestion. Yeah. We're, we'll see, if we get there today, uh, that in the Brisbane of Sarm, God does not specify Egypt as the destination mm -hmm. where the Jews will go down to. Mm -hmm. And that maybe what the Ramban is saying is uh, it was determined that they would go down to a strange land, but not when it is this event that causes it to be Mitzrayim. Interesting. Perhaps he's using his principle of Asa Abel Simon Nabonim, except it's a rather strange application. Yeah. He, this is he Masavo Simulabonim is that what happens to the Abos actually is a simon as to what will happen to us. The Ramban, not the but the Ramban uses that, but here he's this is this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Okay. The, yes. No, interge intergenerational effect is something you can't get away from. That's correct. I want to be six feet tall and have right. wavy blonde hair. Correct. Oh, yeah. This is what they want to do. <laughs> That's intergenerate. And, and, inter and you were born where you were born? See, in some cases, it's a decision that's made by others. Right? My English name is Stanley. Stanley. Because my father, for whatever reason, didn't like the name Sam. The name is Shmuel. And he named me after Stan Musial, the baseball player, <laughs> in English. I was a terrible disappointment <laughs> when it came to that terrible particular era. All right? A bad, terrible. You became a tourist guy. What? I, I, terrible disappointment in, in Stan Musial's <coughs> world. Yes. I'm just curious about the language of the Ramban. He said, it was, it was decreed. By God. By, yeah. What? Right. So it, again, it's hard to understand why the Ramban would feel that this is why the decree, you know, occurred that we end up in Egypt. It's a difficult. It's a difficult stretch. For us. Nonetheless, I, 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 just to, I just wanted to just understand that. In mm -hmm. other words, where does the Ramban? We also know that when we that the Torah says that we don't, we don't. Uh, pay for pay, pay. The, the children do not pay for the okay. sins of the father. Right. That's, 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 this is going to become a bigger problem. Okay. So let's hold on. Okay. All right. I want to go to event number two. <coughs> event number two is a very, very quick study. Event number two, however, is fascinating when you think about it. Let me set the stage. Avram's traveling along with his nephew Lot. For some reason, a riv develops, a dispute develops between the shepherds of Lot and the shepherds of Avram. Now, there are all sorts of interpretations about what that riv is about. We're not going to get into that now. Avram turns to Lot and says, you go west, I'll go east. Let, basically, the land cannot support us together, and therefore what we have to do is, unfortunately, we have to split up. You go one way, I'll go, you go right, I'll go left, you go left, I'll go right. Lot travels and ends up in the city of Sodom. And we're going to talk about Lot's involvement with Sodom probably in the next year. What, what's next? There's a war. And in that war between a series of kings, Lot is taken captive. And here we pick up the story with the following. A survivor, and who that survivor is, is the subject of, of, of debate again in the, in the rabbis. Might be old, right? This is the end. You're looking now at the bottom of page two. 
והוא שוכן ואילו נאם אמרי הוא אמורי, אחי אשול ואחי הנר ואם בא לי בריס אברהם. And he is living in Elo named Amre, where Amre is the brother of Eshkol and Oner, and they are Vale Bris Avram. Vahishma Avram Kineshvach here. Avram hears that, he, that his brother is taken captive. Vahyorek is Haikov, etc., etc. He goes to safety. Now take a look at those two psukim. Don't look yet at the English, and if you did, too late, right? But there's a problem here. Number one, this is the only time that Abram is called the Ivri. It's the first time. Number two, why is the Torah giving me all this information? He was in Dame Namamre. And there were people there that, that were his valet bris. What are they? Fine. Just they're his own people. So, why is that important for me to know now? <coughs> why doesn't the Torah simply say, He's told. What do I have to know? Where he is? How he is? Who's he's with? Not important. Not important. Why is the Torah giving me in the sentence all of this information? So if you turn the page... We encounter our friend the Sparno again. And in this case, the Sparno actually is, is, seems, seems to be untar untargeted. Number one, he says, why, is it, uh, why does it call Avram Ha'ivri? Because the survivor knows that Lot's an Ivri and Avram's an Ivri. So therefore, although he does not know that they're related, says the Sparno, he knows that, that this guy might care what's happening to, to another Ivri. And why is it Torah telling me that he's in Elone Mamre and there are brothers in Malikris? Because it's a harbinger of the fact that when Avram goes to save Lot, they will go as well. And how do I know they go as well? Because when Melat Stone says, you know, I want to, I want to pay you for the role you played in defeating the army against me, Avram refuses, and he says, just pay Eshkol and Mamre for the thing Avner Eshkol and Mamre for the things they did. So clearly, this sentence is a harbinger, says the Ramban. A reflection of what's about to occur, Sporting. which is that his Sporting. allies, what? The Sporting. The Sporting. what did I say? Roman. Thank you very much, I was testing. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> Sparno, the Sparno says that, that these individuals are going to <coughs> rush to Avram's aid, and that's why it's told to us that they are Vale Brisapra. There is, I believe, another explanation. You turn back to the sentence again. So what, 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 by Yaged li Avram or Ivri? Who yosh, by Yen Avram or Ivri, who should name by the name Amre or Amori, etc. Lod and Avram have parted in not such a great way. Right? In other words, there was family friction. Avraham Here's that load is taken captive. He has no reason to get involved. In fact, he has every reason not to get involved. He is in the Ivri. This is not his battle. And he is living in relative safety because he's living in Elo Neymamre and Eshkol and, and, and and Aner are Bali Bris Avraham. So Avram finds himself facing Lot's captivity at a point in Avram's life where he could say, Not my problem. Right? Not only is it not my problem, why should I get involved in something that doesn't affect me? 
and risk the safety that I have. So says the Torah. Immediately he hears his brother is taken captive, and it's not his brother, but it is his brother from a philosophical point of view. And he leaves the safety that he's in to go save him. And therefore, that might be why the Torah is telling us all of that information. Telling us why Avram has no reason to get involved, and shouldn't get involved, and why it's so great that he does involve himself. Okay? That's, that is number two. Now let's go to, no, to episode number three. <coughs> episode number three will take us a little more time. Episode number three is the story of the bris bein haftari, the covenant between the pieces. And the Torah basically says the following. It was after these things. What things am I talking about? After the fight that Abraham wins. Because Chazal said he is now concerned that maybe he's used up his merit. So Hashem is reassuring him. And Hashem comes and he says to Avram, Do not fear Avram. Don't worry, I am your protection and you are going to get great reward. So right off the bat, what does Amram do? Does he say, thank you, God, for that promise? He says, Hashem, wait a minute. You're promising great things, and I have the one thing that I want, the one thing I need. You're not giving me. Right? Now this, this returns us back to a debate we had last week where we said that the difference between Noah and Avraham is that Noah is responsive, whereas Avraham is reactive and initiates. And a lot of you said, are we supposed to do that? Well, it's a good question. Does Avraham, is Avraham right in, in basically <coughs> saying, Hashem, I'm challenging you. You're not giving me the one thing I want. The Torah says yes. Right? Then what happens? Hashem says to him, he again says, Lo natsato zera. Hashem says to him, Lo, don't worry, Eliezer will not inherit from you. You're going to have a child that will inherit from you. And then the Torah says, Ve'hemin ba'ashem, very difficult pasuk, Va'yach shimeo lo tzedakah. He had believed in God concerning this promise, and God held it in his stead so that could be Hashem or Avraham. Could be Avraham felt that Hashem was promising him a child and therefore it was tzedakah. Or Hashem found that Avraham's belief in him was tzedakah. All right? Could be either one. He takes him outside, he shows him the stars, and he says to him, you're going to inherit this land. And again, Avram challenges him. Last underlined line, in the first part. How do I know that I will inherit the land? Hashem then takes him out. He's taken him outside now. And he tells him to cut some animals, to, to pay some an take some animals, slaughter them create lines through which Hashem will pass. And he promises him, don't worry. Your children are going to be ch strangers in a strange land, and they're going to work very hard and be tormented for 400 years. That, that issue of 400 years is something we have to discuss at some point. And after that, I will judge the nation that torments them, and the fourth generation will return here. Which is a fascinating possible. I just want to stop on that portion for a moment. 
What does it mean? The fourth generation will return here because the Avon and the Amorites will not be completed until then. What am I being told? That there are other people have their rights. And that my, I'm going to be delayed in coming to my land because of the rights of the Amorites. They don't deserve to get kicked out until that point. And if, if they don't deserve to get kicked out until that point, you're going to have to wait. And that's fascinating, isn't it? For those who say that Hashem only relates to B'nai Yisrael, that's not correct. Hashem relates to all human beings. He relates, we believe, to us differently, but he relates to all human beings. And that proof of that is found right here in the text. Hold on, son. We'll come back. All right? Now, we are faced with some very difficult issues here. Is Avraham right in, in challenging God? Saying, it's, why is it that he believes ultimately that he will have a child, but does not believe apparently that he's going to inherit the land? Which of those two which of those two issues in your mind is a, is a more far-fetched? That he's going to have a child at 99 or, or that he'll inherit the land? Why does he say, when it comes to that, particular, to that particular promise? So I want you to take a look at the bottom of the page. And here we have someone who disagrees with the Ramban. But he says something again that speaks of intergenerational reverberation, but it's difficult to understand. Omar Rabbi Yavo, this is taken from the Talmud. Yeah. Bottom of page four. Mitnei mane enash. Avram avinu v'nishtabu v'nam v'mitzrayim. Mitnei shasa angorya. His menash, why was Avram nenash? And his children become servants in the land of Egypt. So one answer given by Shmuel is because he, he took the Talmidei Chacham and those who were in his household and went out to say, look, that that was a problem. But more particularly to our event, Shmuel Omar, that was Rabbi Rao who said that, and Rabbi Elezer said the first one. Shmuel says, he should never have asked, how do I know I will conquer, the, will, will receive the land? And the fact that he asks that eventually causes the descent of B'nai Yisrael to Mitzrayim. And, and, that's, and he says, that, and what's the, the, the logic of the Gemara? The logic of the Gemara is, why is God talking at this point about a descent to Egypt? Hashem, he, how am I reassured by the story of descent into Egypt and the fact that I'm going to be slaves for 400 years? How does that help me? So, it's a, so according to the Gemara, it's a reaction to the question, not an answer to the question. In other words, you are, you are going to be punished for doubting my words. However, there's another possibility. Is this Avram's doubts or emotions? Yeah, doubts? Avram's doubts. No, you're right. Emotion. It says emotion. emotion. All right, oh. should, should be Avram's doubts. All right, now, let me just look at that. Now, let's, let's go on. Let's go on. The second Medrash says no. The second Medrash in the name of Rabbi Chaimino says, Lo kikore tagor elo omar lo ba'ezaskus. Famoi daki roshena wasn't a question of God, it was a question of his descendants. How do I know that my children will merit receiving the land? Promising me that I'll have a child is up to you. Promising me that they will inherit the land is not only up to you, it's up to them. To which God responds with the story 
But Rabbi Chia says he responds by put, sacrificing the animals, and his answer to him is, they will merit it in the merit of the karbanot. And that is what these animals represent. Now there are those who say the animals represent something else entirely. That it was the custom in those days to make a covenant by dividing animals and walking through. Like a blood brother kind of thing. So Hashem is using the, 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 the process of the moment to, to encourage this covenant. But we, we are faced with some very difficult questions here. How is this really an answer to Abraham's question? Let's assume even that what he's asking is how my children will marry. How, what's, how is this an answer to my question that they're going to be slaves in Egypt 400 years? I don't need that information now. I don't need that information. So perhaps one could say that what Hashem is saying is don't worry. There will be hard times, but you'll get through them. Perhaps what Hashem is saying is, there will be hard times, but your children will merit eventual redemption because they will still be redeemable after those 400 years of Egypt. So perhaps these are very, very different possibilities in the Brisbane, I'm sorry. But there's one more question, and with this we'll end. That question is, <coughs> what happens when God breaks his rules? Breaks, breaks, breaks his rules. All right? He's telling us the future. He's breaking the rules. He's telling us what's going to happen here. So the rules generally are that God knows the future but does not what? Doesn't tell us that. By telling us he's affecting, the, and once he tells us that, then are all, all the things that occur, Yosef and his brothers and all the things that lead us down to Egypt, are they just players in a play in which they don't have any options because it's already been predicted that we're going down to Egypt? So I'd like to answer this by, by suggesting the following. God sometimes will, redeem, re, will reveal in broad terms the scope and the, and the trajectory of history. But the details of that history are up to us. And I'll give an example. Hashem says that Mashiach is going to come. So I can sit down and say, guess what? Mashiach's going to come. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to work. I don't have Mashiach's coming. So what do the rabbis say? No. How he comes, with what difficulty he comes, when he comes, all of those things remain within my power. When Yosef is sold as a slave by his brothers, that is an event that is totally of their free will. The fact that it eventuates that they, the nation will end up in Egypt, again, Someone pointed out before, I think it was Sai, that Egypt is not specifically identified here as the country to which they're going to end up. So maybe if Yosef wouldn't have been sold, they would have ended up in a different country. It would have been a different kind of slavery, and it would have been a whole different kind of story. So therefore, that God is revealing the trajectory of history, but the specifics of the unfolding of the story remain ours. 